Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. The first thing I want to do is talk about some of the elements of addiction kind of break down some of the different components of what it feels like, what it looks like. Uh, and this is also from, not just from being in, you know, a culture and a family where I've had a lot of contact with addicts, but I have my own things going on. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be something socially unacceptable. Any of my students will tell you that I've quit drinking chai about 100,000 times. So <laughs> I can't seem to stop drinking it. So anyway, uh, here are some of the components of addiction as I see them, have experienced them, and have experienced them in other people. Longing. Suffering. Ritual. There's nothing more ritualistic than addiction, right? And we could, you know, even with chai and coffee, you know, we get that also. <laughs> devotion. Devotion to that substance. Devotion to that state. Uh, one pointedness. <laughs> and most importantly, the longing for something, some experience that will relieve you, relieve one, of the burden of selfhood, the burden of that small self, right? All of these things, longing, ritual, one-pointedness, devotion, uh, suffering, and that desire to be relieved of selfhood, to be relieved of boundaries, uh, to be relieved of the burden of being you. Those are all components of a spiritual practice. So from the perspective of my spiritual tradition, addiction is an aspect of spiritual practice except that it has forgotten its proper object. So it contains all of the, or many of the wisdom virtues and wisdoms that we use and learn on a spiritual path. But the object has been mistaken. So there's been a detour to a different object. <coughs> Longing is absolutely the main ingredient for self-realization. You cannot be on a spiritual path if you don't feel longing for something. When we feel that kind of longing, we don't quite know what it is that we're longing for, and yet we do. So we might say we're longing for something, I don't know what it is, and then you know we go to a yoga class, or we go to a meditation class, or we pick up a drink, <laughs> or we go to the refrigerator. There's a wonderful movie that was made by a student of Dzongsar Kyense Rinpoche's uh, called Words of My Perfect Teacher. One of his principal students that was filmed in, uh, for this documentary had a really wry and wonderful sense of humor. And he's talking into the camera. And he says, you know, we get up in the middle of the night and we go to the refrigerator and we open the refrigerator and 
We're just looking for something. But what we want isn't in the refrigerator, right? So when we drink or shoot drugs or whatever it is that we're doing, we're looking for something. And it's the exact same thing that someone on a spiritual path is looking for. Exactly the same thing. Looking to discover your real nature. Looking to find continuity and connection in your life. It's the exact same longing, except it's under tension. So it's been that that longing has been bound up in a lot of karmic tension, we would say. Uh, and so there is ignorance about what the proper object of that longing is. Now, one of the things that is fundamental to the realization of yogis in my tradition is that everything in reality works the same, uh, no matter how expansive and free it is or how contracted and limited and ignorant it is. There's only one set of basic processes that are working the same way continuously through all levels of reality, right? So when I say that addiction is a spiritual practice, I mean it. I'm not doing, say, using a metaphor here. I'm really saying that actually the same wisdom virtues that operate for people who aren't drinking or never did care about any of that stuff, uh, the same principles are operating for someone who's deep <coughs> still in acting out their addiction. It's exactly the same. The only difference is how much karmic tension you're under versus how much of your karma has entangled so that you've been able to wake up a little bit and discover what the real object of your longing is. Everybody in this room knows what the real object of their longing is because you're here. <laughs> that it takes a while to wake up to that. There's a writer that I like very much. He died of AIDS in the 1980s. He was Cuban and he moved to Paris. Uh, he was an art critic. Um, he was also a painter and he was also a tantric Buddhist. His name was Severo Sardui. And he said something that illuminated the whole state of addiction for me many, many years ago. So I have to credit him with cracking open the door for me and for, uh, to, for a real understanding of addiction. He said, I drink because, he was an alcoholic by the way, he said, I drink because God denies me true intoxication. I think that's the most profound statement about addiction or any habit pattern that we have, not just something we've labeled addiction. Any habit pattern that we have that keeps us in a small, separate, compulsive state, we could say that about. I do X because God denies me true intoxication. We're all looking for God intoxication. We're all looking to discover that expansive nature that is our own nature uh, that we call God. You want to call it nature of mind, you want to call it Buddha nature, Christ consciousness, Shiva nature, we call it in my tradition. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, but we all have some inkling of what it is. We're, that's inevitable. We all know, at least in some inarticulate way, that we have a much more expansive and aware nature than we experience from day to day. And we all long to discover that. And how do we deal with the fact that uh, we want it, but we can't have it right away? One of those ways of dealing with it and, and really trying to get that is by using substances that help us to experience enjoyment, social sociality, uh, a le a lessening of our boundaries, 
all of these things, we all want happiness. We all want continuity and connection with other people. How are we going to find that? The ultimate connection is by becoming self-realized. <laughs> all the other things we do are also trying to get that, too. So, interestingly, there are several words in the Sanskrit language, which, which is the language of my <clears throat> tradition, that mean both addiction and devotion. <laughs> you know, at the heart of addiction is the heart of devotion. And there's several words that point toward that. One of them is sevana. It has many meanings, but uh, it can mean addiction or devotion. It also means a practice. Both addiction and devotion are practices. And when you think of them as both practices and you put them side by side, you can see that addiction and devotion are similar practices. When we do practices with devotion, we do them uh, with a certain feeling of commitment. <laughs> right? Who's more committed than an addict? <laughs> There's another word called rasika, uh, which also means having a taste for something. We can have a taste for self-realization in the same way that we can have a taste for some substance that we enjoy. And that word also means both devotion and addiction. And then my favorite one is prasakala shakti, which the primary meaning of that is a full bosom. <laughs> or a, the, the primordial thing, the primordial object, the original object. But it also means addiction and devotion. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is, what is our primordial object if not the, our real nature? That is the bosom in which we ultimately, the only bosom in which we ultimately can take refuge is our own nature. When we take refuge at the feet of the Lama or the Guru, we are really taking refuge in our own nature. We're not, uh, that person is standing in for us until we have fully realized the correct object of our devotion. Even the Lama or the Guru is only a step along the way, like a bottle might be, uh, a step along the way. The lamas may be a little more expansive step. <laughs> but still, we have some ways to go until we 100% understand that the true, our true object of desire, of devotion and refuge, is our own primordial nature, that full bosom of our own primordial nature. So, <laughs> yeah. So... In our tradition, uh, the kind of tradition that I'm in is called a direct realization tradition. And it is a tradition in which renunciation is not emphasized. In the sense of, there's not a lot of vow taking. There's occasionally some, but the purpose of taking those vows is more just to manage our energy than it is because of some sense of having to chastise ourselves or right or wrong. It's more of a functional, energetic practice if we take vows. Renunciation, uh, the head of my diksha lineage, diksha means initiation, said that in the end, uh, a realized yogi understands that the only thing to renounce is renunciation itself. Mm -hmm. We're just being in life. We're not accepting or rejecting. Neither of those is uh, useful. So, 
There's also, and I think this is quite in contrast to many Buddhist traditions, from what I understand, although not in contrast to my Dzogchen lineage, uh, the understanding that the wisdom virtues of life are not things that we can cultivate. So uh, in terms of, for instance, compassion or devotion, those inherent wisdom virtues of life, we can't really cultivate them because they permeate every aspect of reality and they really have nothing to do with whether we cultivate them or not. How we work with those wisdom virtues is by using our practice, our sadhana, to drop our karmic tensions, to unwind our tensions and very deeply relax so that those wisdom virtues just come bubbling up naturally and we express them spontaneously and naturally. It's the same with something like addiction. We have maybe precepts that we're following to make it possible for us to absorb teachings and get the best out of our uh, practice as we possibly can. For instance, I don't teach students, well, I don't, I, anybody can come to my classes, but if someone wants to work with me uh, on a more intense level, I don't work that way if anyone's smoking pot. That's because of the particular functional things that pot does to people's energy bodies and minds. It's very pernicious. So the way that we work in general with our fixations, let's just leave aside you know, any identifiable addictions that you know, 12 step programs work with. We all have fixations. And we work with those by relaxing our tension so that the fixations eventually just go away on their own. It's very rare for anyone in, anyone in our traditions to be um, working with their karmic tensions in a really um, uh, combative way. It's rare to work with them in a combative way. We work around them until they become obsolete. We really just let them fall away. And I want to read you a quote um, from my Satguru, which is the same as Tawa Lama, or uh, I don't know, what's the word for your main Lama? Oh, they usually say something like Root Guru. Root, like yeah, that. Root Guru. So my Root Guru in Anamayama said this. <clears throat> Go on obeying unquestioningly the injunctions of your guru. Just as if the roots of a tree are regularly watered, the tree gradually grows. The old leaves fall off and new leaves appear on their own. Similarly, simply go on performing whatever is assigned to you, and you will see that whatever is destined to appear is, by, is destined to disappear is by and by disappearing of its own. And whatever is to come into being is appearing in due course. Do not indulge in thoughts such as, I'll give up this, I'll give up that. Just hold on tenaciously to one sacred mantra, and you will see how everything will be accomplished of itself. So this is how we work in the traditions that I'm in, that I teach in. I think that if you had asked me um, 10 years ago, did I think that you know, people are always addicts, that, they could, that they're always in recovery no matter how long it's been you know, since they used something, um, I probably would have said that's a bunch of psychological babble and of course people can recover to, you know, and go on to, be, to transform themselves. Um, today, my answer would be somewhat different. I do think that we can be profoundly, I know from my own experience with myself and my students, that there's profound transformations that happen from doing daily practice, that you can be completely re-embodied. Uh, patterns can change and be dropped completely. But you can't really recover from the wisdom virtues that fuel addiction, because those are the wis same wisdom virtues that are being expressed by the divine everywhere. You know, devotion <laughs> being the primary one, uh, the love of ritual, all of those you don't need to recover from. 
No one needs to recover from those. Those are part of the absolute exquisiteness of human life. And basically, you just express them in a bigger way, in a different realm, uh, without that feeling of anxiety. And they become, you know, absolutely the most beautiful, uh, rich aspects of our lives. So uh, I think we don't need to recover. <laughs> we just need to uh, discover those wisdom virtues that with their proper object and let that come to its full fruition. And then we can be addicted to our own real nature forever. <laughs> I'll just stop there. And if anyone has questions or comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Can you explain the karma extension? Yeah. So we have habits of body, habits of our energy, and habits of mind. Body, speech, and mind is how that usually gets said in both Buddhist and Hindu traditions. And those habits are patterns of consciousness and energy moving through time. That's what karma is. Just uh, patterns of consciousness and energy moving through time. And some of those patterns are what make up our everyday activities. They're informing our everyday activities. When we relax those patterns, we move from karma. Karma means activity, but it specifically means bound activity. Activity bound to repeat itself. Activity bound in a pattern that repeats itself. We move from karma to what's called kriya. That's K-R-I-Y-A. Kriya means activity also, but it means spontaneous activity. So just to give you a very practical example, if I you know, drink a chai this morning, I'll just use myself as an example, and then I have to have another one in the afternoon and another one the next day and another one the next afternoon, that's karma. And then I'm thinking about chai in between the other two. <laughs> um, if I have a chai and then forget about it for three months and then have another chai, or have three chais in a row and then forget about it, that's kriya. Right? <laughs> so kriya doesn't exclude any particular kind of behavior. Kriya means the appropriate spontaneous behavior of enlightened mind, as you might say. I don't really know how you would express enlightenment, um, but so Kriya is the spontaneous activity of someone who is awake and t has taken refuge in their own nature. When we do practice, we relax. We relax very, very deeply, and those patterns start to unwind. The compulsion just starts to dissolve on its own. So in recovery, there's the idea that if someone is active and they're sick, and however they're sick, that there is an action that can be taken from a member of the, the program, like a 12-step where they can go and they can say things and help the person do things. Does the spiritual path that you're a part of this, is there an action or an inciting incident that happens that can reach out to someone who is sick, or is it the idea that they become interested in a path and then they seek it themselves? Is there something, is there a relationship with re reaching well, I guess, out? Are you asking about uh, getting someone into a practice, or are you asking about what happens when someone's already in a practice? Like, is there such a thing as 12-stepping in the spiritual path? I don't know how else to say it. Mm -hmm. Like with recovery, like specific goal, thing. Because in recovery, the goal is to help them understand that there is a solution, and that once they understand the solution, they understand it's a spiritual solution. Mm -hmm. But in a spiritual path, the solution is already spiritual. There's no other name for it. It just mm -hmm. is a spiritual path. Well, so, what you're, I think you know, tw the 12 steps are what are called view teachings. You know, view teachings tell you the view of a tradition, right? So the 12 steps are the view of 12 step traditions. And in, 
in all of the traditions that I've studied in, there are also view teachings. And those view teachings, though, are not uh, applied in the same way that the 12 steps might be. For instance, you might remind someone in one of your programs about one of the 12 steps. Is that what you're talking about? I guess I just mean someone who's, who needs help. Well, How to reach out and help them. Mm -hmm. um, like someone calls the hotline and they're drunk. Yeah. And somebody from AA will go out to their house and sit and talk with them. Right. And if they sober up, maybe they're going to go to detox, or maybe they're going to go to a meeting when they get sober. But we don't proselytize. We're not out there selling it. We're not promoting it. It's mm -hmm. attraction rather than promotion. It's the tradition we're just talking about. So how would that work? In oh, in my tradition, it works like this. Um, there's all different kinds of students. Um, and some of them come and go and do whatever they want. Uh, when they ask for help, I try to give it to, give it to them. And if they don't ask, you know, I pretty much leave them alone when I can hold myself back. <laughs> uh, and then there's students who have a deeper commitment to the teachings and to me. And then there's some who have actually signed on and been initiated. And once you are initiated, it's much more no holds barred. Uh, basically, when you're initiated student in any one of these traditions, hey, Hannah, you uh, basically give your teacher permission to get in all of your shit at will, <laughs> whenever. Huh? Sounds like sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's all different kinds of things like that. But basically, the, the, the teacher's only function is to help, right? To be available and to help. That's, that's the only function of the teacher. Um, can you talk a little about the, like the guilt or shame that often accompanies habitual patterns? Um, like the right way to relate to that? Mm -hmm. Guilt and shame are very, very different. So guilt is a, an avoidance pattern. Uh, guilt is something we manufacture when we don't want to take responsibility for ourselves. It binds up our energy uh, in a way that actually prevents us from taking forward action. Right? So... Uh, I'm so guilty, I'm so guilty. It's very narcissistic. One of the, I wrote a piece about guilt, and one of the things I said in it was, you know, if we ran over a dog with our car, and we get out of our car, and you know, everyone's trying to help the dog, but we're standing on the curb going, I'm so guilty, I feel so guilty. You know, it's ridiculous. Basically, we, we're just, it just stops us from doing anything positive. And it's a secondary effect, it's just a defense mechanism. So if you can really recognize what it is, it actually isn't an emotion particularly, right? It's just something we do. It's like going like this so we don't have to actually see a situation or do anything about it. Shame is a response when, shame is a very primordial response. Uh, you know, even animals have that response. It's a response when we, the, the origin of shame is when we are expecting to be welcomed or met in a positive way, and that doesn't happen. So shame starts with like this, and then we don't get that response from the person or the world, and then we're like, oh, something must be wrong with me, right? So the little baby reaches towards the mother, and the mother goes, Ew! And the baby's like, oh, like this. That's what shame feels like. So shame really has a lot to do with our relationship with the world and our really the way that our goodness, our primordial goodness, has expects to be met with goodness but isn't always met with goodness. How we work with that is the same way that we work with a lot of so-called negative emotions. Recognize that whatever activity you're doing is that's bound up in shame 
is something that has uh, at its core something that was once an expression of your essential goodness. Find out what that is. Examine whatever that activity is that's causing you shame and find that wisdom virtue. What is it? What are you actually expressing? What wisdom virtue are you expressing that isn't being met in your environment? That's step one. Right. Step two is recognize that whatever that goodness is, whatever particular form of goodness, generosity or love or compassion or whatever it is, you know, um, that is yours to give away. It's not actually lacking, it's yours to give away. I'll tell you how I learned this. Um, I used to have a meditation spot out in the woods where I used to live in Berkeley, California. It was, you know, kind of off trail. And I, I used to go up there and practice. And I always had this thing in me where I was always bemoaning. This is since I was like four. I was always bemoaning that other people treated each other unkindly. I felt this terrible agony, even when I was a little kid. Why are people so mean to each other? Why are people so unkind to each other? <clears throat> and I cultivated this feeling of betrayal. Right? And one day I was sitting under this tree. I was already in my 30s. And I realized that if I was so missing the kindness of other people, then I must really, really know what kindness is. If I was so missing it in other people that I'd spent my whole life like cultivating this feeling of betrayal that other people weren't kind, then I must really recognize kindness. I must really understand it. So, Whatever it is that's not meeting you in the environment uh, that you are missing is what you really understand, that wisdom, whatever that is. And then the next hop, the next thing I immediately realized was, wow, I don't have to wait for other people to be kind. I can just be kind. If I understand it so well, I'm full of kindness. I'm not missing kindness, I'm full of kindness. And that was just, everything just evaporated. So whatever it is you're missing, that's what you have to give. If you're missing it so much, you know, that you're indulging in whatever you're doing and you're feeling the shame, you're missing it so much, you must know it very well, whatever that wisdom is. You're actually full of it. You're not missing it. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.